Joseph D'Angelo used to work here, a police officer by day and by night the East Area Rapist. The first 44 rapes and two murders were committed while he was a cop here. As if the violence wasn't enough, the Golden State Killer had another wicked signature. Of the victims he let live, he would often ring them weeks and months after the attacks to continue the terror. The taunting still haunts Margaret Wardlow and Jane Carson Sandler. He's evil. Psychological. He is evil. He's a psychological, evil, psychotic, crazed madman. Madman. A cruel, sadistic, serial predator, D'Angelo eluded capture for 42 years. Joseph D'Angelo, a little old man living a double life in suburbia, hiding behind the facade of a family man, a law-abiding neighbour, and perhaps, most incredibly of all, a former police officer. This is Sacramento, capital of the world's fifth largest economy. It's the Canberra of California, home to the Golden State's parliament, its treasury, and the governor's residence. And now, tragically, home to one of this country's worst ever serial predators. A monster whose reign of terror began when this was the epitome of the American dream. Back in the mid 70s, there were lots of open spaces, jobs, new housing developments, and an almost small town innocence. An innocence that evaporated with each and every brutal attack he carried out. It was about 6.30 in the morning. My husband was just leaving for work. And my, and my three-year-old son came out of his bedroom and got in bed with me to snuggle. But within two minutes, I saw a bright light shining down the hall and someone running down the hall. I hardly had time to react when I looked up and there was a man wearing a ski mask, holding a large butcher knife. He proceeded to tie us both up, our, our ankles and our wrists with shoelaces. He was tying your son up? Yes, and he gagged us both. And he blindfolded us both. I'm wondering, what is this guy contemplating? And he did it for the longest time. And then, as soon as he untied my ankles, then I knew what he was there for. The fear, the fear was so overwhelming. I'll never forget it. Callously, after sexually assaulting her, the attacker spent more than an hour inside Jane's house, helping himself to what was in her cupboards, and even cooking a meal before finally leaving. It was absolutely an obsession to be able to find out who this rapist was. He left an extensive trail of destruction, didn't he? Hardware stores didn't have locks on the shelves anymore. Guns were going, flying off the shelves as well. Everybody was a suspect. And we got to thinking maybe he has a law enforcement background or maybe he's military because of the method of operation. He was a pro at making sure nobody was going to know who he was. And, and where is your bedroom? Margie? My bedroom was downstairs. And he could see straight in. He could see straight in, yeah. Margaret Wardlow was 13 when she became the East Area Rapist's youngest victim. Ironically, she was obsessed with the case and had read dozens of newspaper stories on the attacks. So when he came for her, Margaret knew exactly what she had to do to survive. He had an MO, and that was he would place these plates on the back of the husband and tell the husband, if I hear these plates rattle, 
I'm going to kill your wife and I'm going to come back in here and I'm going to kill you. And this night he put the plates on your mum's back? Yes, I heard the plates and I could hear him go into her room and at that moment it was almost like um, a calming voice inside of me that says, you know, you're going to get raped, this is what's going to happen, but you're going to survive, you're going to get through this, it's going to be okay. All the way through the attack, I was just, I was just saying no, in, you know. It's courageous. He really got off on power and control through fear. The fear in his victims is how he really got pleasure from what I could understand from everything I'd read. And so for me, being able to tell him, I don't care what you do, that was my way of telling him, you mean nothing to me, I'm not afraid of you. Joseph D'Angelo is accused of being one of America's worst serial murderers and rapists. He managed to evade capture for over 40 years, and that's likely because he was a police officer. It was a career that began here in the tiny town of Exeter, California, and where he learnt to hide his criminal perversions. You thought he was quite smart, did you? Oh, yeah. He knew everything about everything that needed to be known about law enforcement. Up until a few months ago, Farrell Ward counted Joseph D'Angelo an old friend. They worked together as police officers in Exeter and socialised on the weekends. Farrell now looks back at the crime scenes they attended together with a very different perspective on his brother in arms. D'Angelo had everyone including his law enforcement colleagues, fooled. If he'd committed a crime here in Exeter, uh, he would come out <clears throat> and do the follow-up investigation, and there wouldn't be no evidence, because if he turned up any evidence, it would probably most likely been him. He could destroy it. <laughs> yes, very easily. Yeah. And no one could have picked it up because he's... He was just that good at what he did. I mean, he was, <clears throat> he was free for, what, 40 years, 45 years in the FBI, and the, and the very best technology they got out there, they couldn't find the guy, you know? So maybe you were right, maybe he was smart after all. Oh yeah, he was, he was one smart cookie. He rarely went into a neighborhood that had two-story houses. He liked to move around, hop fences, and move through the backyards. Detective Hall says in the mid-1970s, Joseph D'Angelo moved from Exeter to the suburbs of Sacramento, which then became the rogue cop's new hunting ground. As far as the law enforcement training, he understood exactly how patrol was going to respond to uh, an attack that had occurred. And so he would park his car at locations so he could, as law enforcement is potentially responding, slip through that and get to his vehicle many blocks away from where the victim's house was to be able to drive. 42 years after his first sadistic rape, Joseph D'Angelo was finally arrested here at his home, hiding in plain sight among his suburban hunting grounds. A retired father of three daughters, he's been married to a local divorce lawyer for all those years. And ironically, despite specialising in the trade and being estranged from him since 1991, she has never divorced Joseph. You see, the law here says communication between spouses is privileged. You can't be forced to testify against your husband or your wife in court. In short, we may never know exactly what she knows. I, I have said all through the years, somebody knew who the rapist was. Former and lead investigator Carol Daly still can't work out why suspicions about D'Angelo weren't raised earlier. He had a different ski mask for almost every rape, a different jacket, different shoes. If he threw them away after each use, uh, I have no idea. What did he do with everything he stole? Did he bring them into his house? Did he hide them somewhere? So if you were a partner or a wife, right. all you think you would have some sort of inclination that something was going on? I would think so, but then, um, you know, if he was out all hours of the night, it would either be divorce time or wondering, you know, what are you up to? Margaret Wardlow and Jane Carson Sandler have waited 40 years 
to look the man who raped them in the eyes. Today is that day. But looking at the shuffling, frail, elderly man in orange prison overalls, it's hard to picture the Golden State Killer, the monster behind at least 50 rapes and 13 murders. This no, yes. Seeing him in that orange jumpsuit, it must have given you some pleasure. Yes, I feel there's closure. I know where he is now. I've taken pictures of this building. Uh, I know where he is, and this is, hopefully he'll stay here till the day he dies.